Hey everybody, it's Eric with Barrel and Hatchet, and we are recording Hatchet Cast Episode 2. By we, I mean me and Roy. We are going to be talking about optics today, and we're going to have three different categories that we're going to kind of talk about. So we've got reflex optics with magnifiers. Disclaimer, when we say holographic or red dot, that falls into the reflex optic category. The next thing we're going to talk about is LPBO or LVPO or whatever acronym way you want to talk about it. And then prism optics. I've got Roy here with me. What's going on? And so we're going to be talking about these different categories, um, what rifles we like to put them on and what setups we like to usually run them on, um, their kind of purposes overall, and then what our experiences are with them and then a conclusion. Uh, but we are super excited to be recording this episode and uh, yeah, let's just jump right into it. So reflex optics with magnifiers. Roy, what are we talking about when we say reflex optics? Looking for something that has kind of more of an infinite eye relief that you can get behind. Nice and quick, no magnification typically behind it. Illuminated reticle is what we're usually doing uh, when it comes to that. Obviously, you have your different variations from different manufacturers, all that kind of good stuff. You have your EOTEX, you have your aim points, you have tons of different variants and flavors that are out there to choose from. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like, and this isn't a comparison between, like, EOTech and Aimpoint and who's better. I mean, whatever flavor or farts you like to drink in the morning. I mean, it, it really is just what is the purpose. Um, so this isn't a comparison video in terms of between holographic and red dot. No, not, not a comparison at all. We're not going to tell you what brand to go buy or anything like that. We pretty much have ran a little bit of almost everything out there at some point in time. Yeah, we have our opinions on what's good and what's not good, right. but that's not the direction that we're looking to go today. We just want to break it down and share our experiences with different ones and kind of clear the clear the air a lot when it comes to what you can actually do with your optic. There's so many people that say, oh, I can't do that with this type of optic. Yeah, yeah. I've, and, I've only got a dot. I've only got a dot. There's no way that I can... What, what's that good for? I hear that question. Uh, for you guys that know me, obviously, I have a gun shop, okay? So I sell optics. Yeah. yeah. Okay? Uh, <laughs> and I get that question. I want to be able to shoot a target at 100 yards. Can I do that with a reflex or a, or a red dot style optic? Well, if you're asking me the question, probably not. But yeah, we, we got a place to start. <laughs> exactly. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to clear the air, what you can actually do for you guys that are listening and go from there. So one of the setups that, or what setup do you usually like to have, like what length barrel would you like to have a reflex optic with a magnifier? I'm typically running a reflex style optic with a magnifier on it, about 10.3 and longer on 5.56 cartridges. Uh, so my current one, my current, you know, love of the month right now that I'm running <laughs> uh, is a 11.5 uh, SIG MCX Virtus that's running a uh, magnifier and a 3X magnifier and a red dot. Uh, yeah. So that's my current uh, current fling right now. Yeah, and you've got that on a Unity riser? That is on a Unity riser, yeah. So, yeah. so reflex optics are super fast. If I want to be able to engage something really quickly, there's no magnification, I can just bring uh, the rifle up to my eye, that dot will be there or that holographic reticle will be there um and i can squeeze off shots really quick the mag the magnifier kind of just helps out with it there's a shot i need to make at a little further distance or just identify yeah or identify or identify something at a further distance that's what that's going to do for you yeah a reflex also is going to help you out with your parallax Uh, a lot of people that don't understand as far as parallax a reflex if i'm shooting a target at 25 yards with a reflex style optic i'm just going to draw up if my dot's not necessarily dead center or my rifle slightly canon, it's not going to make that big of a difference. Right. As some of the other optics, as we get into them, that may make a difference. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I, mean, I think one thing you also talked about parallax. Like, if I have like a cheaper red dot, like an NC Star. Top not of the necessarily line. all of them are cheaper ones that have parallax issues. Yeah. We'll get yeah. into that on another day. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, yeah, hundred percent. You're gonna have massive parallax issues. Yeah. Um, you are going to need to be directly behind the glass with that dot dead center any kind of variation to shift we see it all the times when we're shooting at the ranch where we do all our tests at jtac ranch um here in florida we see guys constantly having parallax issues with slightly cannon because maybe their optics choices aren't necessarily the best or they went and got a chinese diving board (laughs) off of amazon that would be eric (laughs) so i mean i love 
Uh, I usually have a EOTech and a Vortex three power. It's what's the it's a small one. Yeah, it's a new micro three yeah. X. Uh, I don't know that exact model number, um, what they call it, but it's a three X magnifier that you're running. And so. it's freaking awesome. It's super tight uh, and it goes right up against the EOTech real nice. I have it on a Bro Bro Engineering riser. And uh, the, that's a really good thing that you can actually do with a reflex optic is you can aim very quick with night vision if you want to aim passively or with a gas mask. Um, and it has, if you especially have it on a riser like a Unity riser or a BroBro Bro engineering riser, it makes it so much easier. 100%. As soon as you can get above like that one point, uh, like 1.7 type height, like a lower one third or higher, it becomes so much easier to shoot behind, like if you are running nods or if you're running a gas mask or something like that. And that's the beauty behind a reflex style optic. It is so easy. There's so much out there in the market. The, the choice is, like I said at the beginning, there's 9 million different flavors of what you can pick out and do. And everybody has copied very, very similar footing footprints as far as the way these things mount. So just pick up, I'm running a Unity mount. You're running a Bro Bro, what is it called? engineering a bro bro engineering. <laughs> bro bro so there's unity there's uh you know uh tons of different companies that make risers uh, so that is a beauty very simple to set up on your gun yeah and and something else that you can do with reflex optics that used to be real big and i, I feel like people are coming out of it but is um what's that called when i have my iron sights in my uh my reflex optic what are iron sights? <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Musket scope. Musket scope. So back when we were shooting muskets. <laughs> so, uh, no, yeah, co-witness. Yeah, so co you have that typical straight-up co-witness, uh, which is miserable. And then you have lower one-third, which is a little better. And then welcome to the modern world, get into like 1.93 height. And it's so much more comfortable. Yeah. So much more comfortable yeah, I mean, to shoot behind. Freaking... Can I get a co-witness? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Freaking, <laughs> uh, I'll say co-witness is good if you're not, uh, if you still like getting a solid cheek weld and having backup iron sights. I mean, but um, I think co-witness comes into play depending on the platform and how the platform is set up. Yeah, you have certain platforms. Let's just jump into a sub gun real quick, okay? A true sub gun, a fully automatic burst type sub gun, getting your cheek buried down into the gun. With a co-witness style optic, you're going to manage the recoil better. Yeah. That's all there is to yeah. it. But you're talking about a burst, a rate of fire, very high rates of fire. You got a MP5 or MP5K or something like that. It's going to. CZ Scorpion. CZ Scorpion, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you're you going to want to control that rate of fire. Um, we've done it before in the past uh, with a BNT APC9 that was full auto. Yeah. That I brought out to the ranch. We had a lower mount on it, and you were able to control the recoil put a higher mount on it where your head is up you're not controlling the recoil as much uh, under full auto rates fire but that's that's a whole nother subject for another day i think there's a cause uh, or a a general time frame when you probably still need that co-witness but for what we do on a normally daily basis what 98 percent of the market and the consumers are going to be out there man a reflex with some type of riser on it is money yeah and that magnifier for a little bit better pid so i'm i mean one one thing to talk about specifically, if you are running a reflex optic and you go to zero, uh, your dot and your magnifier, make sure you do it separately. So we always recommend zero your dot first, then you use your magnifier to kind of adjust that reticle to be centered in the tube if you are using that magnifier. Um, it could throw your shot off if you try to zero both of them at the same time, and then when you take that magnifier away, there could be some shift. Definitely, 100%. Let me ask you a question, Eric. Mm. How far can you shoot a red dot out to? Oh, man. What kind of target distance can you hit? Well, I could throw a bullet over the mountains, <laughs> Napoleon Dynamite reference. Anyways, uh, yeah, I mean, we've shot out to, I want to say, 600 yards. Now, that's that's poking holes, obviously, um, but 500 yards consistently uh, with a red dot and a magnifier or even just a dot. So we've basically what you're saying is if you can see the target and you've taken the time, to learn your holds, yeah. correct? Yeah. That you can hit it. Absolutely. And so, especially if it's the holds where it's like, hey, I know I'm holding two dots high over the target. That's what a, a good hold would yeah. be or something like that. Most definitely. So yeah. Learning your... I, when it comes to choosing your optic and your platform, yeah, we run reflex-style optics with magnifiers in that 10.5, 10.3 barrel, 5.56, probably up to about a 12.5-inch barrel gun a yeah. lot of times. Yeah. 
actually on a 12 and a half, we start to probably look at something a little bit different. Okay. Um, sometimes, uh, depending kinda on like an LPVO, kind of like an LPVO. Yeah. Oh, nice. Kind of like an LPVO kind of leaning into that. So in that 11, five range, we're running that. And I can tell you that all of us that shoot out there at the ranch at some point in time have poked some targets out to about 500 yards relatively pretty consistently. Yeah. I got an eight and a half inch crank that we've hit target 500. 500. Yeah. What <laughs> yeah. was an aim point? It was, no, it's a uh, Hollison. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, it was a Hollison. Hollison uh, 503, I think, CU. Um, so mounted on a low mount right up on the gas tube, Ultimate gas tube. Yeah. And we've hit 500 with that thing, with 545. Yeah. Pretty consistently. Yeah. It's definitely doable. And, and, and the good thing about reflex optics is it's a good way to just get into the game. You know, if you want to get your skin in the game, Getting a reflex optic is going to be a lot more economically priced and in a good range. So much easier. Just very simple. I get customers that come in and they're like, hey, I want an optic. I want to get away from these iron sights. I can't see my target. I can't shoot. <laughs> and it takes me two seconds to throw a red dot on it and show, show them how to zero it. And they're off shooting. It's just so simplistic. Um, you know, we won't get into talking about zero distance and all that and holds today. Regardless of what optic we choose, this would probably be a closing fact, but at the end of the day, regardless of what optic you choose, figure out what zero you're going to go with, and then learn your holds. Yeah. That's yeah. that's the most important thing. It doesn't matter if it's a red dot with a magnifier or if you got a telescope on there that you yeah. can see 10 miles with. Yeah, right. You need to learn your holds. Yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, going into telescopes, by the way, I mean, LPVO is another good option. I mean, they're really, when did they start really kind of getting super popular? I'd say, I mean, really popular in the past probably two years, two, three years, right. for sure, 100%. Yeah. You're seeing them, now you go to the range, you won't see 10 guys open up the range bag, probably six of them are going to have LPVO yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, Which I think a lot of that has to do with price point. Like, they used to be super expensive. Now they've come down. Quality's gone up. Price has gone down. 100%. You got great quality optics. If you got a budget, I tell people all the time, come up with your budget and then find an optic that fits it. And then in the LPVO range, prices have come way down. Yeah. There's a good quality optic, generally speaking, in almost everybody's price range. Now, you got to be realistic. You come in and say, hey, I want an LPVO for $100 with my mount. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, that's not going to happen. Yeah. I can get you a red dot for 130, 140 bucks. That's going to be quality. Yeah, Hollison. Hollison all day long. I know we weren't going to talk about brands, but <laughs> dude, I've, I I've, I hear so much smack against Hollison. We have beaten those things to death on pistols and rifles, and they just hold their own. They do for sure, 100. percent But so LPVO, talking about that, a couple downsides to it. One, yes, your cost is going to go up. We yeah. just said it, right? You yeah. can get into a Holosun. You can get into a six-hour, six-hour Romeo series of red dots. Uh, micro red dots are actually really nice. They got a new micro magnifier that's really nice, too, at the same time. So red dots and magnifiers you could typically get into at a lower price point. So if you're on a little bit tighter budget, don't necessarily. I know we said, hey, we want to run these on 10.5 to 11.5. Maybe go with that. Right. Even if you got a 16-inch gun. You can always use it because you're going to get a shorter gun. That's all there is to it. If you only got a 16 right now, you're going to what? I want it as short as it can be. Six-inch barrel. <laughs> Six-inch <Just> barrel. <laughs> what a 12 ex extension. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Now, LPVOs are obviously downside to them. It's going to increase your budget. Um, but you can definitely still find something out there. Primary Arms, Vortex. Man, tons of companies. We can yeah. go on for days talking about companies that build them. Advantages, obviously. Well, I mean, you can PID things at a distance. You can also make more accurate shots. I mean, your typical uh, range of zoom uh, is going to be like 1 to 6, the most popular, to 1. Now that Vortex has a uh, 1 to 10 Razor HD Gen 2, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, they have you have 1 to 8. We have EOTech Voodoo goes 1 to 8 that Roy uh, has on his 13.7. Um, you've got 1 to 6 is the most popular. And even first focal plane or front focal plane or... Yeah, front focal plane or first focal plane, whichever way you slice it. Um, they're, or, and they're cheaper, dude. And, like The prices come way down. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, I'm running a second focal plane. Everybody's like, oh, you got an LPVO. You got to run a first focal plane. N not necessarily. You really don't. Because at the end of the day, you got to look at your magnification range as what you are actually truly going to use. Are you an individual that says, hey, I got a Vortex 1 to 10? Are you going to use that 1 to 10 range all the way? 
Maybe. The way I, maybe. Okay. If you're going to, yes, the first focal plane is what you're going to want to look for. For me, and I think you can include yourself at the same time, I run my LPVO almost on a fixed set. Like from, four. Like four or five. Yeah. I'm, I have a one to eight um, EOTech Voodoo. Reloading. And I'm running it on four or five pretty much all the time. Oh. Now, I do run a red dot on top of me. That allows me to engage everything inside of 100 with a red dot. My red dot is my primary optic on top of that. Yeah. Uh, that 13.7 is basically what I'm running that on. And then I switch over when I need to shoot a little bit smaller targets, PID. I do have the magnification that I can roll up if I need to use it to shoot. But I can tell you, I primarily shoot everything out to about 500 yards with four or five magnification. And that is also depending on what you're trying to do. So, like, if I am trying to PID something, you bet your balls I'm going to be cranking that zoom all the way in to be able to see detail. But if I'm trying to make hits, I mean, shoot, we just said that we can make hits with red dots, like, at 500 yards. So, um, as far as making hits, it makes life a little bit easier. Um, but it's not necessary to have it zoomed all the way in to make that hit, especially there's this, we're going to go ahead and squash this myth, myth, you know, myth, myth. Thank you. I was about to say mystical creatures, <laughs> uh, but is you don't have to have something that zooms all the way in or has a lot of zoom power to hit distance targets. Like just squash that right now. If you think that I'm wrong, then tell all those guys who are in world war two that were smacking targets with iron sights out at 500 yards so put some time behind your yes your rifle yes that's what you got to do you got to put some time behind your rifle what are you running an lpbo on i know you've had some experience with night force right yes yeah, so i usually uh i had a night force attacker one to eight for a while um it's something that uh i've had some experience behind um and i also had the primary arms one to six that i ran for a while um that was that was an amazing optic uh i've run the uh vortex one to ten um, it almost feels like too much glass sometimes if I have it on a smaller gun. You know what I'm saying? So like, I, I agree. Uh, <laughs> Chris actually, um, he uh, that shoots with us a lot out at the ranch. You know, I'm throwing names out there, not everybody knows. Them. He's a total toad. <laughs> now Chris, awesome. Chris is actually running one of my old Steiner one to fours. Yes, it is a phenomenal piece of glass. I know it's outplayed nowadays by so many other optics that are one to sixes and one to eights or one to tens. But that one to four, that thing is just right on. It I smacks. love that thing. It smacks it all smacks, day. Dude. Yeah, that and, thing's awesome. And so I will say with an LPVO, because there's all these extra bells and whistles, you got the zoom, there are some learning curves, right? There's Definitely some learning curves. Uh, curves. Curves. <laughs> um, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely a learning point that you have to that you have to adjust to. Part of that is going to be your eye relief. We talked about eye relief and red dots. It's basically an infinite eye relief. doesn't matter. Get yeah. behind the glass. There's a parallax issue. Mm. Um, anytime you start to magnify it a little bit more, that parallax comes into a bigger play. Which we should probably do a video on that sometime. about. That, we're going to definitely do an yeah, eye relief and parallax and how to mount it. Mount 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 it. 100%. We definitely need to. Uh, as we continue on with all these, uh, you've got some issues to figure out when it comes to when you're shooting. Um, and with an LPBO, no you would agree, right, 100%, that you're going to have to overcome that eye relief and figure it out. You're going to have to overcome that eye box as far as getting directly behind it where it feels nice and comfortable to you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. does the 30 mil, the 34 mil and the 30 mil, what, what's the difference and what helps with that? The larger we create the tube, you're just basically going to have a larger eye box. So that's why you're seeing the modern scopes moving towards 30 millimeters as standard now. Right. You don't see anybody with a one-inch tube on an LPBO hardly anymore. 34 is going to be the standard, and I'm going to tell you 35 is going to probably be the new standard here soon. Really? Yeah, so, I mean, I know in the larger scopes, like uh, the Lopold Mark V HDs. Night Force Attacker. Night Force Attacker, things like that. Uh, they are a larger tube already. They're running a 35 millimeter. Uh, the Vortex is obviously a 34. That's going to help with that eye box, and it's going to help with the eye relief quite a bit also. And it's going to allow more light in. Yeah. It's going to draw more light in too if you're in lower light situations. Right. So. Yeah, the Night Force Attacker 1 to 8 is a 34 mil tube. Uh, it is big. I mean, that's a trade off as well. Like, if you want a bigger eye box, you want more bells and whistles, you're also going to add some weight to that and a little bit more bulkiness. But. Um, it depends on what you're trying to achieve with that tool, uh, with that rifle. 
that's going to determine, hey, I'm willing to trade off the weight because I want more capability. That's a great point. Um, weight. Everyone's always like, wait, wait, wait. Want a lighter rifle, lighter rifle. We see it a lot in open gym because we get a little competitive in you open gym. A, you want a little less weight, quit running your daggum steel plates in your plate carry. How about that? So we talk, yeah, we talk about uh, weight, uh, you know, in our open gym at JTAC. We, we do a lot of stuff on time, on clock, and, and it's a competitive atmosphere. So guys are trying to cut weight on their guns and they want them lighter, you know, uh, more of a competition aspect sometimes is what the guys do. And then, and then we switch it up on them and we change the whole aspect and they're like, oh man, now I do need a light. Now I need something with some magnification. I need to be able to see that. I can't see the target. Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, I mean, you, you do have to, uh, kind of take all these things into consideration in that aspect. And we'll kind of get this at the end and conclude in our closing statement, but there is no do-it-all gun. Like just, just like there is no do-it-all tool. I don't use a hammer to hit a screw or mm-hmm. use a ratchet to. You know what I'm saying? Like there's different tools for specific jobs. Could I use a wrench to hit a nail? Yeah, I could, but it's not be- as good as a hammer. And there's no do-it-all optic. Agreed. Um, just like I said earlier, I'm running an LPVO. Guess what's mounted on top of it? Hollow sun. Red dot. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, so it's uh, there's no do-it-all optic positives to an lpvo pid and targets yep super clear glass on some of these models nowadays yeah. but being able to pid targets is such a huge thing and that's why you're seeing a lot of people move to it yeah. uh, hog hunting coyote hunting all that kind of stuff like that comes into huge play when it comes to that the reticles are getting better. You're yeah. getting a lot of different types of holds yeah. in them. So we talked about learning your holds earlier, right? Right. Man, I tell you, some of these reticles that are in it, these manufacturers are doing all the all the math for you. Yeah. I mean, it's just like zero it. They tell you to zero at 50 yards, and then this next line is 300. The next line after that is 400. The next line after that is 500. That's great. It's simple. Yeah. It really is simple. Um, so I do like that about an LPVO. Downside that, that I struggle with a little bit is getting directly behind it i'm definitely still faster behind a reflex style optic that's where i struggle yeah and and some one of the things that you could do um with it if you're having trouble in the lpvo it's not just for you or a reflex you want a little bit something a little bit more maybe look at a prism so talking about prism optics the obviously the most famous one is the trigicon acog it's been in service since the dawn of time uh well since the dawn of the gy i mean really uh, bomb proof tank uses natural light to illuminate the reticle that's inside of it it's a fixed power scope or a fixed power optic so four power sometimes there's other brands that have prisms that are at different power settings but let's let's jump into that yeah prisms are great um right off the top i've been running an acog for a while i've had an acog for beyond 10 years yeah. uh, mine is beat the living snot and back so obviously we have a durability. You have less moving parts inside of it. So as far as you're talking about something that's more bomb proof, a prism style optic like an ACOG, obviously ACOG has been proven. Everybody knows how bomb proof it is, but there's a lot of other great ones on the market that are very solid also. Anytime we can take an optic and we put less parts into it, you're gonna be better off. Yeah, I it, mean, the good thing is like, I don't have to worry about power just like LPVO and uh, prisms is the reticles usually etched into the glass. Yep, the reticle is going to be etched into it. Uh, where that comes into play, also, also is if you if you have eye issues, um, if you're an individual that has a stigmatism or something like that, mm. having that etched reticle gets rid of that blurriness that a red dot gives you. Uh, gets rid of that star bursting that you see a lot of times. Right. So having that prism type optic where it's a fixed reticle that's etched in the glass is huge. Yeah, and, and the good thing about the uh, ACOG um, is you also can put a dot on top. So if you want a reflex-type optic and also have the zoom capability, running an ACOG on top or running it at a 45-degree angle, uh, can it off to the side, is a great way to do it. We've been Actually, it's been a favorite of ours for a while. It has been. for the. For, so I kind of stepped away from the ACOG for a while, so I ran it for a very long time and then I then I moved away from it went to like a comp m5 or, or not comp m5 comp m4 yeah aim point and then eventually went to an EL tech threw a magnifier behind it and then I found myself moving back towards the ACOG and then I ended up throwing a red dot on a 45 
let's talk about red dots on 45s real quick. I know we're yeah, taking, yeah, we're, actually, we're, that's we're, a great... we're going back. So let's just, we're, we're going to go back for a second. We're going to obviously add it back into the red dots, but now we're mixing categories. We mix categories with LPBO, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We're mixing categories with the prisms. You can do whatever you want. That's, that's, that's the beauty behind this. Hey, at first when I was running ACOG, I threw one, uh, I threw a red dot on a 45 and that was awesome. It became, gave me the best of both worlds. And then somebody kind of talked me into changing it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I totally convinced Roy. I was like, hey, if we're running Unity risers and all these high risers, let's just throw the dot back on top. Um, I know what I want to get a nice cheek weld for the 45 and just rotating the gun. But having the dot on top with that heads up display really helps with shooting with a gas mask, shooting passively with night vision. Um, is just super fast, and you can you can run some fast runs with a dot on top. You can definitely run some fast runs, and it's a little higher than a, like running like a Unity. It's it's above that one nine three or two inch, but you can definitely do it. And that is once again the beauty behind having something like an LPVO or a Prism. Yeah. We we have that ability to continue to add that red dot factor yeah. of that infinite eye relief or that you know that reflex style optic into it for fast type shooting yeah and, quick and, engagement and, and that's that's something real quick jumping in throwing in this optic just because it's it was a socom issue it's been used for a long time a lot of people like it it's heavy but the l can is what, what what would you consider that's a perfect mesh of almost lpvo it is prism. it's a perfect mesh um of lpvo and kind of prism like and apparently it's about the only thing that scar 17 can run <laughs> <laughs> without breaking <laughs> or primary arms one to six <laughs> or primary arms one to six uh, prisms are great they really are uh the l can obviously that's that's another proven phenomenal optic um trigicon acox there's a lot of other great prisms though out there man um vortex has a new little 3x prism so if yeah. you're an individual that wants to still keep a small package and you say hey i want magnification but i i have a problem seeing red dots they starburst i can't see them um or vice versa, hey, I don't want to mount a red dot and a magnifier behind it because that's more bulk. Right. Vortex's new 3X prism. Vortex has a 5X prism. The ACOG doesn't take up a lot of room on the gun. Uh, Primary Arms, they got their new, well, even a 1X prism. Yeah, Cyclops. We got a lot of 1X prisms out there too, which which I know a lot of the guys are running those because um, the eye box on it and everything else like that is it's significantly better than a traditional higher-powered magnified prism. It and it has that etched-in reticle, so they don't have. They want almost a dot, but without the dot, they want an etched-in reticle. So if it if the battery dies or goes out, no worries. Pure reliability. Yeah, yeah. Um, you you don't have electronics to worry about. You take that out. Um, it just it just becomes more more durable overall. Yeah. So prisms are great. I love them. Uh, fantastic. Uh, I love my ACOG. I really do. It's probably still my favorite system that I run. What rifle system would you usually run an ACOG on? Man, I have ran the ACOG on anything from a 10 and a half inch gun up, yeah. up to a 16 inch barrel gun. Yeah. I know 16 inch guns are kind of not cool anymore. Yeah, but... they're, they're still not. <laughs> <laughs> so the new hotness is obviously 13.7, 13.9, or 14.5. Well, it's kind of been the new hotness for a little while. Um, but it, I've ran an ACOG on anywhere all the way up to a 16 inch gun. Generally speaking, where you'll probably find mine is on 11 and a half and above. I know that kind of goes back into our talk about earlier with a reflex, but in a magnifier. But I'm kind of still accomplishing the same thing. Yeah. I'm just running two optics. I'm right. running a prism. My ACOG is currently sitting on my 11.5 Knights, um, and I have a dot on top. What is the mount, that, the cram mount on the ACOG? Let's oh, talk about that real quick. Yeah. So we kind of talked a little bit about it in episode one, but. Uh, the one big issue with the ACOG was always eye relief, right? Like you have to have your eyeball shaking hands with the glass pretty much. Uh, and so you, when you have uh, the cram, all it does is it lifts the ACOG up and it allows you to bring the ACOG back. So that way you don't have to squeeze your face or have your stock collapsed all the way in or brace to be able to see down the Trigicon uh, ACOG. So it lifts it up scoots it back and also the price point is incredible honestly i don't i'm i, I wish i had it years ago you know but weapon yeah. outfighters weapon outfitters has that available definitely changes the acog um but there's lots of great prisms like i said we ran down them uh down the list a few minutes ago at the end of the day regardless of what you pick and choose 
once again, spend some time behind your rifle, spend some time behind the optic. Uh, I fall back into that category a lot of times, changing my stuff around quite a bit. Obviously, I like to play with a lot of different stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I have a problem. Um, running running one tool, Eric says it all the time, one sword, right? Um, you're definitely going to become more proficient. But the more and more time that I spend with these different types of optics, I really don't find a disadvantage to any of them. No. It doesn't really matter which one I choose because what it all amounts down to at the end of the day is how much time I train behind it. And because per, And personal preference. Personal preference. That's it. We can sit here and tell you, that, hey, if you got an 11.5 gun, don't run an ACOG on it or don't run a LPVO on it. Run a, run a reflex yeah. or red dot with a magnifier. It, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It really doesn't. Whatever you choose, find a budget. Figure it out, put something on it, and start training with it. And the other thing also is if something seems it's outside of your budget, just save and wait. Patience is key. Like, you can usually get nice stuff if you're willing to wait and just we save We can up. have a whole episode on Shop Talk about, <laughs> about patient, people needing to be patient sometimes when it comes to their buying choices. That's a this sh- is a lesson that I also need. Yeah, it's a lesson that Eric needs for sure. Just <laughs> Chinese be- diamond board. <laughs> We're going to reference the Chinese diamond board in every <laughs> every every episode. Okay. Uh, I'll have to I'll post a picture of the Chinese diamond board on Instagram for you. <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> for, I don't even know. Has anyone seen the Chinese diamond board no, that you played for the with? Love, nope, did not. I that threw need, it in the garbage. That needs to become public. <laughs> Just like, that needs to be I was public. like why does your dot look like it's crooked? And I'm like, well, it's on there solid. Yeah, it's because it was made crooked. Oh, yeah, freaking the the ACOG is a is an awesome choice. Um, but like Rob is saying, you have to know your holds. You have to get a good zero. Um, when you are zeroing, if you have a reflex and a magnifier, like we said earlier, do the red dot or mag or uh, holographic optic first, then put your magnifier behind it, and then continue your zero. Um, And the biggest thing is when you're zeroing, really just put a bag under your gun, make it as still as possible so that way you get the best possible zero. Uh, And Because a lot of people go, well, it's my optic, it's busted. I mean, how many excuses do we usually hear? Make sure, too, when you're zeroing that here's one of the things that I see. um, I know we're getting close on time here, but one of the things that I see a lot of times when people are zeroing is their head position behind the rifle. Mm-hmm. They'll get in a totally different position where, once again, their eye's not directly behind the optic. Take your time, set your stuff up, make sure that you're comfortable. I had someone ask me today, when they were talking about zeroing a dot on a pistol, said, hey, should I sit down at a bench to do that? I said, by all means, yeah, that's going to make yourself more stable. But the downside to that is, a lot of times, is now I'm looking through that dot at a different angle than what I would when I would be standing. The same thing goes. If I'm laying down prone, I want to make sure that I have that consistent cheek pressure or chin well pressure. If I'm shooting off of a bench, I want to make sure that my head is directly behind that glass. I see so many people struggle with zeroing their guns that they're all over the paper. I mean, how many zero? How many guns do I zero for guys out at the range? Uh, I feel like every time every I'm out, week. every week I'm zeroing rifles for guys. They'll bring it to me, and they're like, "How do you do it so quick?" It's not a matter of that I'm really doing it quick. It's that I'm getting a consistent, me as a shooter, I'm being consistent behind the optic, and I'm being consistent with my trigger press. Get a solid zero. Take your time and spend as much time as it needs to get a solid zero. Don't do a quick zero. Oh, it's good. It's close enough. (laughs) You know, you got a 50-yard zero, and now you're trying to shoot a target at 100 yards. And once again, learn your holds. Yep. Okay? But... You're not hitting, and you're confused. Why am I not hitting? Do because you're you, yeah, freaking not figuring. <laughs> you rushed your zero. You didn't get a nice tight zero. Yep. You didn't get consistent behind the gun. There's a lot of variables that come into play. Yeah. We'll have to do a whole episode on on zeroing alone. Yeah. Um. But it all boils down to guys. Uh, not one is better than the other. Some are better at certain jobs than other ones, but they are all very capable. So you wouldn't know this if you don't go out and get training. As we say, if you have the kit, if you have the gear, if you have the uh, the tools, go out, get training, go to the range, dry fire, all of it. Um, that is how you become truly proficient. Uh, most of the time, the equipment is more accurate and more capable than you. So always try to reach the bar of making yourself as capable as po- as possible so that way you are an asset and not a liability. 
anyways, uh, any last statements, Roy? No, definitely. I agree 100%. Get out and drain. Absolutely. They're all great optics, all great choices, all great, great categories. Spend some time behind them. That's right. All right, guys. Well, this has been HatchetCast Episode 2, talking about optics. Thanks again for checking us out. If you would like to get more notifications about new episodes that we'll be dropping, hit the notification bell as well as subscribe to our channel. It helps us out a lot. And also check out our Instagram page, Barrel and Hatchet Trade Group, as well as AAA Gun and Ammo on Instagram. And we'll see you on the next one.